before we get into the coding side of things, uh, let's talk about the uh, Oscar supercomputer that we have access to. The first thing that we have to do is log into the supercomputer and the, the process is to SSH into schooner.oscar.ou.edu. This will not connect you to a single host, but uh, you'll automatically be routed to one of Schooner 1, 2, or 3. This gives us some load balancing given how many users we have. Uh, there are some scenarios where it makes sense to circumvent that load balancing process. You are also able to SSH into the individual Schooner 1, Schooner 2, or Schooner 3. If you're doing large scale data transfers, don't use Schooner to make that happen, but instead uh, handle those through dtn2.oscar.ou.edu. So those are typically uh, being done with SCP, SFTP, or rsync or something along those lines. Uh, for those of you who are just starting with uh, SSH, uh, this is the, the command line. So SSH schooner.oscar.ou.edu. By default, SSH will assume the same user ID as you're logging in from. Uh, if it's different, then you'll have to add a, a dash L and your Oscar username. At that point, you'll be prompted for uh, a password, or if you have uh, already set up SSH keys, then uh, you'll be let in automatically. There are a variety of different kinds of nodes that are available on the supercomputer. Uh, login nodes and compute nodes. So login nodes, these are all about really providing that human interface to the supercomputer. So they're about uh, setting up, configuring, launching, and monitoring the experiments that you are uh, going to be executing. You, you can use them for limited testing and debugging, and, and that's really appropriate thing to do before you push your experiments out to the compute nodes, uh, but you should never use these nodes to do real experiments. The compute nodes, uh, there are uh, something on the order of about a thousand compute nodes on our supercomputer, uh, and this is where the real work happens. Uh, you don't generally interact with the individual compute nodes, uh, and in particular, you should never log into a, a compute node and start launching experiments there. You have to go through the, the, the Slurm daemon to queue up your experiments. So when you log in to, the, to Schooner, uh, you'll have uh, access to uh, your uh, home directory. So that'll be slash home slash whatever username you have. This is persistent storage. Uh, the storage is relatively limited. It's something on the order of 20 gigabytes. For my case, uh, I am slash home slash fag, and there are some public uh, items sitting in there that you have access to. Uh, so there's some a little bit of example code. There are some data sets as well. When you're doing work with much bigger data sets, you have a variety of different options. One is to use slash scratch. So there is uh, slash scratch slash username uh, that you, if it doesn't automatically exist, you'll have to talk to support in order to have that created. Uh, but this is very large scale storage that's temporary uh, in nature. It's, it's intended for uh, use for a few days uh, for storing a data set that you happen to be using for uh, an experiment and in particular to store results that are being generated by your uh, experiments. If you leave files sitting around in slash scratch, they will automatically be deleted. Uh, but the nice thing is that you'll receive some email before uh, that actually happens. In general, I don't suggest that you do development of code on the supercomputer itself. It's a, a much harder debug cycle. There's some situations where you, you can't really get around it, but uh, but in general, you, you really should be trying to develop and test on your own computer. And then once you have code all up and running, then you bring it over to, uh, to the supercomputer uh, to do the, the real experiments with perhaps much larger data sets. Uh, typically, the, for, for Schooner right now, the individual CPUs uh, are actually 
a, a bit uh, old at this point. So they are generally less capable than what you have on, on your modern laptop. Uh, but the benefit there is that the supercomputer has a tremendous number of CPUs and the CPUs have access to very large memory and disk resources. Um, rather than just copying individual files back and forth between your local machine and uh, the supercomputer, I really suggest that you make use of a source control management system to do that sharing uh, of not only your code, but all of your batch files, your config files, uh, et cetera. Uh, so using Subversion, SDN, or Git are reasonable solutions for this. As a result of the experiments that you, that you run on the supercomputer, uh, you, you might end up producing a very large number of uh, files. And a, a reasonable thing to do is to then transport those files back to your local computer for doing the analysis and, and visualization. Uh, however, I suggest that you don't actually check results files into your subversion or Git repository. Um, those can really cause bloat in, in your repositories and you really want to keep those very lean. Uh, so instead, I, I suggest making use of SCP, rsync, uh, et cetera, to uh, do the transfers of those files. And again, DTN2 is the, the place that the host to be using if you're doing very large transfers. Uh, your results files, especially if you're starting to save models that are relatively large, can, can become big very quickly. Uh, and I suggest that you don't plan to keep them in your home directory or in Scratch for very long. Uh, so make sure you're cleaning up files uh, as you go. Okay, so the, the queuing process is done by uh, a daemon called Slurm. So this is your job control system that's used across many different supercomputers across the country. Uh, the, there is local documentation that's provided by the, the Oscar folks. Uh, the, uh, the link is uh, right here. So uh, in general, the, the process of uh, executing experiment looks like this. So you're going to submit the experiment to a, uh, a job partition. And when they use the word partition, I tend to think of as uh, Q. We'll talk about the different options there in a moment. So there's a, a command called sbatch that will allow you to uh, submit those jobs. Uh, once a job is sitting in a partition uh, and the appropriate compute node becomes available and you are at the top of the queue for that node, sorry, for that partition, then the compute node will pick up your job and begin to execute. Uh, while execution is happening, there are a number of log files that are generated that you can view on the fly. Uh, and uh, and then presumably your, your experiment will also write out its own files when it's done. Uh, once the job is uh, complete, uh, the uh, status of that job is going to be updated uh, within Slurm. And you, you can see that, it's, that, that, that it has completed. Uh, and at that point, your job will be removed from uh, the job control system. There are a variety of different uh, partitions that are available uh, on the supercomputer. Many of them are public. There are some that are re reserved for uh, specific groups. You can uh, get access to a very large list of partitions by using the sinfo uh, command. Uh, what I tend to do when I'm looking at uh, the, the status uh, of uh, nodes is to use sinfo and then pipe that to, to something like a, a grep command to look for specific uh, partitions that I'm interested in. So norm, the normal partition is uh, a pretty standard one that you'll be using. So the, some of the key partitions that, that are useful to you, there is a debug five minute partition. Uh, what's really nice about this partition is that you don't have to wait very long before your job gets picked up. Um, however, your job cannot execute for more than five minutes. There is also a debug partition, the, the same deal, it tends to get picked up relatively quickly. The time limit there is uh, 30 minutes. The normal partition is where you'll be doing most of your work uh, and wait time can be longer here. Uh, and there is a 48 hour time limit on, uh, on 
on executing jobs on, within the normal queue. There are also some nodes that have GPUs, and we're actually uh, going to be installing more here pretty soon. The uh, debug GPU partition uh, allows you to test that GPU code. There you have a 30 minute uh, time limit uh, to, to run things. Once you're done debugging, then you can enter into the GPU partition and uh, you're guaranteed there to uh, also get a GPU, at least one. All right, so your experiments are all configured uh, using uh, what are called batch files. And batch files include uh, several bits of information. Nominally, there's a, a, a section that is all about uh, requesting the resources that you need. And, uh, and then the batch file tells the uh, compute node what to actually execute. So resources, that you might request are things like which partition you want, how many CPUs or cores you want to reserve, how much memory you want to reserve, your maximum running time. Uh, and, uh, and in some cases, it, it makes sense to queue up not just one experiment at once, but to queue up a whole set of them. We'll talk about that a bit more here soon. So we'll, we'll talk through an example batch file to get us started. Uh, the, other, the other side is what we actually execute. So for the demo today, there's going to be a step of configuring the Python environment and, uh, and then actually executing the program uh, within Python. And, and uh, there is an example batch file that we can access. So this is the resource request side of one possible batch file. Uh, notice that it is configured as actually a, uh, a, a bash executable file. So, so typically in, in bash executables, the pound sign means that everything to the right is a comment and should be ignored. Um, however, pound sbatch is extra markup that is consumed by the slurm daemon. Uh, so here we're setting up uh, a set of uh, different parameters here. So here uh, we are uh, requesting partition to be debug five minutes. Resource request in, in the batch file. Uh, batch files are executable bash scripts. Uh, typically in bash scripts, the, the pound sign means that everything to the right is a comment. However, uh, in the situation where you have a pound s batch with no space, uh, that is uh, that is extra markup that's actually consumed by the Slurm daemon. We use that here to set up the various parameters uh, that we need in order to uh, request our resources. So uh, sbatch partition, we're setting that to be debug five minutes. Uh, we're not going to get into this level of detail, but uh, this is all about requesting larger CPU resources one is fine here. Uh, the memory that you specify is in terms of um, megabytes. So we're requesting one gigabyte of memory for this experiment. Um, this, this, one, this line here and the, this line right here are, are both comments since they're not preceded by the pound s batch. These two lines are all about specifying uh, information, uh, file locations for standard out uh, and standard error uh, uh, pipes uh, that your program is generating. The percent %j uh, markup here just means that we're going to substitute in the, the slurm job ID uh, at this point. So we'll, we'll end up with a file in the results subdirectory and then it'll be xor underscore some number underscore std out.txt. The time parameter here is the maximum uh, execution time. Uh, so here we're, ex we're asking for just two minutes of time. The job name uh, gets used. Uh, it'll be displayed uh, when you're querying a slurm. It can be accessed in other ways. Uh, you can also receive email 
uh, when uh, certain events happen. So if your job completes or if your uh, job has an error, you, you'll receive at least some minimalist email to, to say uh, what has happened. So here I've set up to receive all email and place your own email address here. Don't place anybody else's. This last line here, uh, the chdir stands for changedir. Uh, what happens is that uh, at the beginning of uh, execution of your job, uh, the very first thing that happens is that uh, your current working directory is set to the specified directory. So in this case, it's in my space uh, in a particular uh, location within my home directory. Make sure uh, that you set this appropriately. That's actually a very common error to, to set this uh, or forget to set it for your current experiment. Okay, so that's resource request. Uh, and then the other piece is what we actually execute. For what we're doing in this tutorial, uh, we are making use of, uh, uh, of Python, uh, but uh, using the TensorFlow and Keras toolkits for building a very simple uh, deep network. I have a Python environment that has currently the modern version of uh, TensorFlow uh, configured within it. So you're welcome to use that. So you can just copy these into your batch file and continue to use it. My intent is to uh, keep this TF environment uh, available and up to date uh, for other people to use. So once you've activated this particular uh, Python environment, then when you go to execute Python, that'll execute my copy of, of Python with a very specific set of packages. Uh, and here we're specifying the, the Python code to actually execute. And, and then these are parameters that are being passed into the Python code uh, to configure the uh, particular experiment that we want to uh, execute. All right, so setting yourself up for, uh, for an experiment uh, you'll want to change directory to your uh, to whatever directory you have all of your files uh, stored in. Uh, you'll need to uh, create your batch file. It doesn't really matter uh, ex what it's called. Uh, the simple thing is batch.sh, but it's possible to to call that to, uh, just about every anything. Uh, the .sh is helpful to to tell us that this is actually a bash uh, shell program. Um, from there, you'll uh, edit your batch file uh, to uh, set up the parameters for, uh, for your resource requests. Uh, don't forget to set the batch file to be executable. Uh, so at your command line, once you've created the batch.sh file, uh, this change mod uh, command will uh, set it up to be executable by all. So you your whatever group you're in and everybody else in the uh, in, in the Unix environment. Uh, the other thing that you should do in preparation is to make sure that all of your necessary uh, directories have been created. So for the example that we just looked at, uh, we were specifying a results directory where we will be sending the uh, various log files. Uh, and if you fail to create that directory, your the, the your uh, job will just fail. So uh, make sure you, you uh, do a make dir, in our case, on the results directory. You can also test your batch file before you actually send it to a compute node. Uh, so to do that, make sure your current working directory is set to uh, wherever that batch file is. And then you can execute within the shell dot slash batch dot sh so that that will ignore all the slurm information and just execute uh, the Python configuration and then the, the Python program. The thing to keep in mind is that when you do this, you are executing code on the login node itself. So when, when you do this, you should make sure that your experiments are very fast uh, and not doing big compute things that, that require lots of memory or lots of disk access. Uh, but getting through this process is, uh, is an important step. Uh, it, it really helps to make sure that things are uh, actually configured properly before uh, you send them out to the compute node. All right, so 
to uh, queue up your experiment. Uh, here again, I'm assuming that our current working directory is where that experiment uh, directory is. So the same directory as your batch file and the operative command is sbatch batch.sh and you'll, you'll get a, uh, a message back that says what, uh, what job number uh, you've been assigned. Uh, and uh, at that point, your job is sitting in uh, one of the specified partition waiting to be executed. You can check on the status of any jobs that you own using this command. So sq-u and then your uh, username, or you can look at the entire sq if you wish, but there are, you'll, you'll have lots of output in that case. So once your job has completed execution, uh, you will have uh, at minimum two files uh, that have been uh, generated. Uh, so the standard error log file, the standard out uh, log file. Uh, standard error it, it will contain all of the errors and warnings that your program uh, produces. Uh, when you're using TensorFlow, you tend to get lots of different warnings, uh, depending upon what architecture you're executing things on. And some of those are important, others are not. Uh, standard out is anything your program has uh, sent to the, the standard out pipe. Uh, so anything that you're printing within your program. Uh, on top of these two files, you're often also uh, producing other uh, kinds of files. You might save your learned model, you might save history information, uh, et cetera but that's all within uh, your control. You can uh, also, with one sbatch command, you can also queue up more than one experiment to execute at once. And, and this, is, this becomes important uh, because uh, during evaluation of our models, we want to train up uh, different models with different configurations or different data sets. And we also want to be uh, evaluating those models with other independent data sets. And it is very convenient to be able to send off a whole batch of these all at once. So Slurm, what Slurm allows you to do is uh, queue up a set of experiments that are numbered between zero and 999. And, and you can do any number uh, within that range uh, you can you can also specify an entire uh, range. So within your code, uh, then you'll have some little snippet of code that will translate this zero to nine 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 integer into a specific experiment. So you might uh, select a different data set to load up for training purposes. You might uh, also specify uh, how many layers you have within your deep network. Uh, using this uh, particular integer. Um, for this particular tutorial, um, we're just going to use this, uh, this number to, uh, to allow us to execute multiple repetitions of the same experiment, um, but uh, it, it is actually a pretty powerful uh, tool for doing the, the much larger scale experiments, such as when you're doing hyperparameter searches. So the thing that we add to the batch file when we want to use this uh, is the array parameter. And here we're uh, specifying that we're going to execute four independent jobs uh, numbered zero through three. And, we're, and that's inclusive. This is not Python rules here. Uh, and then when we execute the job, when Slurm actually executes the job, it will set up a uh, a bash shell variable called slurm ar array task ID that you can then uh, use within the uh, the, the bash, the, the, the batch.sh file. So here is one particular example where we're firing off Python for our XOR base. Um, we're still using 10 epochs. We'll talk about what that means uh, in our uh, demo, um, but instead of uh, what we had before, which is exp0. Uh, now uh, we're going to put in an integer that is something between 0 and 3. And, and we'll be guaranteed to execute all four of those cases. And if the supercomputer is not very busy, 
all four of those will start executing essentially at once, uh, which is uh, pretty nice. All right, so uh, a few other comments before we're uh, done here. Uh, there are lots of different people who are using the Sipu computer uh, from students to, uh, to researchers. So it's important for all of us to play uh, nice within this domain. Uh, so here are a few things to be thinking about uh, in terms of playing nice. So first off, uh, we want to make sure we're using the login nodes for really configuring and starting jobs. Also, it's reasonable to do the very basic tests. We, it, it's also important to take the time to really understand what your resource needs are, in particular, how much time you think your, your program is going to need or how much memory you, you think your program is going to need. Uh, if you uh, overestimate, uh, well, so, so you're motivated to, uh, to get your time estimate about right, uh, because if you uh, request a very big chunk of time, you only need a small amount of time, it can take a while for your program, your, your experiment to be uh, assigned to a compute node. But if you underestimate the, the execution time, then uh, when you hit that time limit that you've specified, Slurm will stop your job and send you an error message. Uh, you should also not be executing servers on the login nodes. So if you want to do Jupyter kinds of things, uh, the login nodes are not the place for that. The Oscar sysadmins do allow some uh, of this on the compute nodes. You should email them to find out what those procedures are and what the rules are. Uh, and as you start to get to your much bigger experiments, do, do that planning uh, very carefully, the, especially the resource planning. A few other notes, uh, once you've queued up a, a job, uh, it's sometimes tempting to go into your code and start tweaking it again. But uh, until your, your experiment actually starts executing, there, that, that code uh, uh, that you're changing will affect what is actually going to execute when, when the job actually gets picked up. So, uh, so, so once you've queued up your job, sit on your hands, do other kinds of things, uh, but, but let uh, Slurm do its job. Uh, the log files themselves can be really helpful for the debugging process but there is an awful lot of junk that, that gets dropped into those. Uh, so, so it is worth the time to, to go through those when you're having trouble. Uh, sometimes the Python errors that you get, especially with TensorFlow, can be really obscure. Uh, so, but, but do take the time to, to work through those. Um, do as much testing as you can on your uh, local machine before you push things out to the supercomputer and, and then do very limited testing on the login node to just, just to make sure you have all of your code in the right place and your data sets in, in the right place. And now it's time to work on a little bit of code.